This is Charles Osgood. So far, so good for the Space Shuttle Challenger, which is poised for liftoff about a half hour from now at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Its crew of seven is already strapped in, including the first everyday citizen ever to hitch a ride. Christopher Glenn has the latest from the Cape. Chris? Yes, Charles. Krista McAuliffe and her six crewmates have been aboard for some time now, but they've had a little problem with the hatch into the shuttle, a bad reading from one of the uh, micro-switches, which indicates whether that door is sealed properly. It looks like they've got that fixed after fussing with it for a while, and they're conducting cabin leak checks right now. Earlier, there were high winds aloft, which could have affected the launch, but that seems to have cleared up. Now there's a low, solid deck of clouds over the Cape, and uh, they say there's a big hole in the clouds, about 60 miles wide, that's coming this way, but isn't here yet, and they're wondering whether it will be here uh, just in time for the planned launch, about 37 minutes or so from now. If they have to wait a few minutes, they will for that hole to get here, Charles. We'll soon find out. Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. More after this. From ABC News, I'm John Dagnan. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, they are still trying to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger. We go live now to ABC's Vic Rapner at the Kennedy Space Center. It's a foot and a half long handle, which is supposed to close the shuttle's front door and then come off. But it won't come off. It's stuck. The screws won't come out. And NASA had to send for a drill to fix the problem. For a change, however, the weather is cooperating. The clouds overhead have moved out. And although it's chilly, about 40 degrees, the launch weather looks good right now. The seven shuttle crew members, including the first teacher to go into space, Krista McAuliffe, were up early this morning, smiling, and are now in their seats on board the shuttle, waiting for repairs. Vic Ratner, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center. And I'll have more after this. ABC News, I'm Kate Dorden. The Shuttle Challenger is late for a very important date. We're waiting for the launch now, and you won't believe what's holding it up. A stuck door handle. ABC's Vic Rackner is with us live from the Kennedy Space Center. The door handle used to close the shuttle hatch wouldn't come off. It took a drill and then a hacksaw to get the handle off. Now engineers have just made repairs, and while those mechanical problems were being worked, well, the weather was getting worse. Clouds and higher winds moving in. Still, NASA's hopeful there's about another hour and a half in which to get this flight off today. And if the space agency cannot do that for some reason, chances for tomorrow are uncertain because of a deep freeze moving in. The seven crew members have been sitting patiently in the shuttle cockpit for over three hours now, waiting and hoping. Vic Ratner, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center. ABC News, I'm John Dagnan. NASA engineers have fixed a broken door handle. Now the race is on to beat the weather. ABC's Vic Ratner brings us up to date on efforts to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger from the Kennedy Space Center. They solved the door handle problem by sawing it off with a hacksaw. But while those mechanical repairs were underway, another problem cropped up. The winds have been getting stronger and stronger as the clouds moved back in, and those winds are now too strong to allow a launch, at least at the moment. NASA's waiting and hoping, and the flight director, Jane Dunn, told the crew they'll wait for at least another hour. So we hope between now and one o'clock we'll get a good shot at it, but uh, it doesn't look promising at this moment. That's the way it looks at the moment. No go and not very promising. Vic Ratner, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center. The weather is also a problem in the south. Florida's citrus growers are flooding their groves to help retain heat as a bitter cold front moves into the deep south. Temperatures drop to below freezing today in Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Atlanta got up to an inch of snow. The forecast calls for temperatures in the teens in northern Florida by late today. I'll have more after this. A possible peace overture from Libyan leader Mo the astronauts have been shuttled to the launch pad for another attempt at a liftoff. Christopher Glenn is standing by at the Cape with an update. Chris? 
Charles, they're right at the point exactly now where the trouble began yesterday, closing the hatch. First, you'll recall yesterday, they couldn't get uh, indications of a proper seal. And then after they finally got that figured out, they had that balky hatch handle. They couldn't remove it, and they had to before flight. Well, they won't have that problem today anyway because they've traded out that kind of a hatch handle for uh, something else. All the astronauts are inside. Uh, Krista McAuliffe said uh, on the air-to-ground communication that she sure hoped they would go today. And the weather is perfect. And it looks like uh, they may, in fact, fly. No technical problems so far. And launch is supposed to win now, Chris. Uh, it's going to be in about an hour and a half, uh, 10.38 Eastern Standard Time. The cold at the Cape was felt throughout much of the south overnight, forcing many farmers and citrus growers to lose sleep protecting their crops, but no significant damage is reported. What the country's space agency has learned in recent weeks, as well as the rest of us, is that this is a difficult general time of year to try and launch a space shuttle. Patience has been a key element uh, around the NASA operation all this week. We're going to join Tom and Tier now once again. Uh, just getting them about three minutes, and they think they can do it. They are counting. The ice is cleared away, and Challenger should be going away very soon. Let's go down to the Kennedy Space Center and take a look at Challenger sitting on the pad as they continue the countdown. They started the auxiliary power units uh, about a minute ago, and uh, that is one of the major milestones to uh, continuing the countdown. And counting. Gimbal checks now complete. We left over ET yellow two pressurization. External tank liquid oxygen pressurization is started, and purging of the shuttle main engines is terminated. T-minus 2 minutes, 44 seconds in counting. This will be the first time Retraction that NASA has been able to launch from their second input. pad. This will uh, give NASA flexibility uh, in a year where they have 15 launches scheduled. Uh, this launch pad has not been used for a decade now. The last was uh, in the Apollo program. During the six days in space, the astronauts are going to release a $100 million satellite and another one called Halley Spartan that will study the comet. But the highlight on this mission is the including in the flight of Krista McAuliffe, a 37-year-old high school social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire. She was selected from over 11,000 teacher applicants to be the first private citizen to fly into space. She will teach from class, from space, on Friday now. If they are able to get off today, they will have live coverage here on CNN of her giving lessons to students on the ground. They are now within two minutes as they uh, make the final preparations. The computers have taken control now. Coming up on the 92nd point in our countdown. 90 seconds in counting, the 51L mission ready to go. The liquid hydrogen tank now at flight pressure and all three engines ready to go. Coming up on the one minute point in our countdown. T-minus one minute and counting. Sound suppression water system now armed. The hydrogen burn igniters have been armed. These igniters will be fired at T-minus 10 seconds to burn off any residual hydrogen gas. T-minus 45 seconds and counting. The solid rocket booster flight instrumentation recorders have gone into the record mode. Coming up on the 32nd point in our countdown. T-minus 30 seconds, and we've had a go for auto sequence start. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. T-minus 21 seconds, and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, one and liftoff liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower pieces of ice tumble off as the coldest space shuttle launch ever gets underway challenger seems to shake herself free of the ice and goes all five rocket engines burning well the first teacher krista mcauliffe on her way to space with six other astronauts on board
coming shortly from John Lawrence in Houston. Straight up into a beautiful blue sky, crystal clear weather here in Florida, although it's very cold. Everything going well. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Now One minute 4. in. 3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. And across from me, hundreds of school kids jumping up and down and cheering as this space shuttle takes off with teacher Crystal McAuliffe on board. And that means the engines are running well. Two and a half minutes into the flight, the solid rocket boosters will drop away and we should be able to see it. What's happened? What happened? Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Still going. Vic, did something strange happen then? Something is gone amiss. Something is wrong. We have a problem. Nothing from mission control, but I could see pieces of something falling off the side as if one of the solid rocket boosters had come away early, Bob. It's still climbing. The shuttle is still climbing, but there is a problem. There appears to be a serious problem. What's happening? Not a word from mission control. Everybody here is open mouth. Controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Where is the shuttle, Vic? Can no, you see it? A major malfunction. There Obvious. is a... Now, direct from CBS News, this radio net alert bulletin. This is Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. There is a major problem which developed just a few seconds into the flight. We could see it happen. There seemed to be some kind uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of an explosion aboard the rocket. And all of a sudden, all communication with the spacecraft was lost. Obviously, it is going nowhere at this point. It looks as if debris is falling out of the sky. It almost appeared as if one of the uh, solid rocket boosters or one of the spacecraft main engines went awry and something happened. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Oh, a great tragedy here. Krista McAuliffe, the first private citizen in space, and the rocket has apparently exploded in the first in minutes effect, of flight. Uh, We're trying to get some information by listening to mission control. We will report uh, more as we have information available. Again, to repeat, uh, we have a report uh, relayed to through oh. the dynamics officer. A terrible the vehicle thing. has exploded. We are now looking at uh, all the contingency operations and awaiting uh, word from any recovery uh, forces in the downrange field. A terrible thing. Debris falling out of the sky falling slowly, painfully, tragically slowly toward the Atlantic Ocean, just a few miles offshore. This flight, which was to have been such a bright chapter in the history of the manned spaceflight program, turning in a flash of an instant into terrible, terrible tragedy. Of course, um, mission control only giving very scanty information as they uh, scramble to try to find out what happened and to determine exactly what the status is. But as you heard them say, apparently the shuttle Challenger exploded within the first minute or so of flight, and uh, the fate of the crew members is, is unknown, but it does not look good at all. The smoke just um, crazy patterns in the sky, contrails from bits of debris going, uh, going down toward the ocean, still falling. People in the grandstands, uh, fans who had come to for many miles from all over the country to wish Krista McAuliffe well, sitting stunned, uh, some of them leaving and shaking their heads in disbelief. We can see them from where we sit. And all of Mission Control Houston, we have no additional word at this time. A terrible sight and one certainly that I had hoped that I would never have to see. So NASA looking at its contingencies at this point, but really it, it looks absolutely awful. It looks like there is no hope for any of the people aboard that shuttle. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, uh, 
apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water at a uh, point approximately 28.64 uh, degrees north, uh, 80.28 uh, degrees west. The worst fears of all of us we are in space now. for a long time verification realized from, this uh, morning at uh, the Navajo location Water. of the recovery forces in the field to, to see what uh, may be possible at this point. It appeared as if the uh, debris from the exploded Challenger shuttle came down. Uh, and we will keep you advised as uh, further information becomes available. This is Mission Control. Came down just a few miles offshore. So, of course, they will be rushing uh, boats out to that area to try to see what they can find. A most terrible sight, a most terrible event. Naturally, uh, a great deal of confusion as we try to piece together exactly what did happen. And so far, there's been no specific word on uh, what caused the malfunction, what caused the explosion aboard Challenger. It just seemed to be going perfectly, and uh, we had uh, watched it leave. We had thought all was going well, and within 10 seconds after uh, our previous broadcast of the launch of Challenger, a bright orange flash in the sky. Uh, one piece of the rocket seemed to break off from the rest of the main assembly. The the, the main engines were still going uh, on uh, on the on the uh, Challenger itself, and then this spark, it seemed, an ember almost, uh, flipped out to the side, and all of a sudden the smoke contrails were no longer straightened through. They were haywire and going crazy in the sky, and it was obviously and immediately apparent that there was an, an awful disaster had just been, uh, been made. Still now, uh, we can see that smoke as uh, the wind starts to carry it and its patterns are dispersed in the bright blue Florida sky. It was an absolutely perfect day for a launch and everything did seem to be going well and then all of a sudden it happened. Krista McAuliffe and her crewmates, the uh, pilot, uh, Mike Scobie, and... Uh, Astronauts uh, Smith and Michael Smith and Judy Resnick, a mission specialist, has flown before. Ellison Onizuka, a mission specialist, he'd flown before. Ronald McNair, a black American astronaut, mission specialist, he'd flown before. Gregory Jarvis, payload specialist. And S. Krista McAuliffe, 37 years old, Concord, New Hampshire, school teacher, high school at Concord High and uh, listed as a teacher observer on this flight, but of course she was more than that. She had been picked from over 10,000 teachers who applied to be the first uh, private American citizen in space, a, a flight uh, a mission which had been called for by President Reagan some time ago and had spent many months in training for this moment. And then uh, she and the rest of the crew had suffered many delays as the Challenger sat on the launch pad and waited out the weather for three days in a row, some mechanical snafus, which uh, at the time uh, we thought were embarrassing, but now, of course, that has all shrunk into insignificance alongside of this awful, awful tragedy. We can see people running from the uh, NASA headquarters building this here. Mission Control Houston, trying to get a better look we are out coordinating the water. With recovery forces in the field. That news that the bring safety uh, equipment... Uh, Recovery vehicles uh, intended it for the recovery of the SRB in the general area. Those parachutes are believed to be uh, paramedics going into that area. Paramedics now parachuting into the Atlantic uh, in the area where the debris from Challenger fell. Chris, this is Judy Muller in New York. Hello, Judy. Repeat, we had a. Uh, we are following this with you. Apparently normal ascent with the data coming to all positions being normal up to approximately the time of uh, main engine uh, throttle back up 204%. Mission Control saying now that everything on the instrument readings uh, in the launch yes, center seem to be looking all right. The flight, uh, there was uh, an apparent ex explosion. The uh, flight dynamics officer reported that tracking reported that the vehicle had exploded. 
and impacted the water in an area approximately located at 28.64 degrees north, 80.28 degrees west. Recovery forces are proceeding to the area. Chris, we just saw the parachutes going into that area. Yes, Judy, those are, uh, according to Mission Control, they are, are paramedics who are parachuting into the area where the debris fell in the Atlantic. Flight controllers reviewing their data. What they will find there is, uh, is not known. We will uh, provide you with more information as it becomes available. This is Mission Control, Houston. So about the uh, gleanings of that Mission Control report were that was that everything was looking nominal as far as the instruments were concerned and that this uh, apparent explosion aboard Challenger just happened in a flash with no forewarning and no, uh, no instrument uh, indication that anything was amiss as, as the uh, shuttle headed out downrange over the Atlantic in the first minute of its flight. Chris, as you know, the voice of NASA, the voice of mission control, whatever voice we hear, is always calm. But, but in this today, of course, we hear a, a different note of terrible. Well, it's a, it's a steely tone, I think, one that is, uh, you know, a forced calm and uh, the way you get when you are faced with an intensely uh, emotional and tragic situation and, and try very hard to cover it. And I must admit I feel the same way. Here in New York, we see the pictures on the monitor of NASA that sends up of, of mission control and the faces in that room just tell it all. Certainly do. Grim, everybody sitting still, very little movement. This is the first such failure in 56 such man in space missions. Never before has there been one like it, and uh, I very much hope that there never will be again. We have come to accept this nominal idea. We're so used to things, except for minor glitches that we've been hearing about in recent launches except for those minor glitches we're so used to this going almost flawlessly that we i think have taken it for granted almost that's true the uh hard part of this is, i think is that it, they plan so carefully for emergency situations they can turn around immediately after launch and come back and land at the kennedy space center if anything goes wrong they can have an abort across the atlantic at any one of numerous transatlantic landing sites in uh, western africa they can abort once around the world and then come down again in uh, in uh, california or even back here at the cape if they have an emergency in the first orbit they can abort two orbit if something goes wrong just before they get there they can go up and get into a preliminary orbit and then see what they're going to do as a matter of fact, they've done that once, but uh, to to have it happen without any warning whatsoever, uh, without with, any chance uh, with whatsoever. With all those computer backups, telling them when anything goes wrong, even a hatch problem, it, it's amazing that something wouldn't have shown up. I wonder in all that debris if they'll ever know. I don't know. I don't know how deep the water is at that point, but I imagine um, that it's probably still well within the limits of the continental shelf, and it's probably not too deep for salvage operations. Uh, there has been, of course, no official word on the fate of the crew, but um, from our vantage point and from what we could see, and we could see it all, albeit it was several miles away, uh, it did not look like they had a chance. Uh, it, it doesn't appear that any of them could have survived. This would be tragic if it involved anybody, a member of NASA, an astronaut, but it is especially tragic with the first civilian in space aboard. I imagine her family was watching, or is it the Cape? Indeed they were, husband and children. And many dignitaries from all over the country, and um, literally hundreds of educators and school kids who had come here to watch a person that had become something of a hero to them uh, uh, fly away into history. And uh, perhaps history was made here today, but it's not the pleasant variety, not the glorious variety at all. This was to have been, of course, uh, NASA's most ambitious year. They had um, more than a dozen shuttle flights planned, which would far and away top the number that they've ever been able to launch in a single year before. What's going to happen to those plans now? What this is going to mean to America's uh, manned spaceflight program or to the space program in general? 
of course, remains to be seen. Right now, there's uh, no talk of that, only of determining what happened and getting the official word on the fate of the uh, seven-man crew. Chris, this happened just about a minute after launch. Did it not up to that point, since I was not there, could you describe what... Did it look all right up to that point? Oh, it looked perfect. I mean, it looked like uh, every other space shuttle launch that I have ever seen, and I've seen about ten, I think, and uh, everything was going very smoothly. Uh, mission control was uh, sounding very, very confident. The shuttle was climbing up into a very clear, blue, cloudless Florida sky, and uh, all of a sudden, flash, and uh, the... The one bright flame that we can usually spot as the spacecraft carries out over the Atlantic for dozens and dozens of miles became two bright flames. And uh, it looked almost as if one of the solid rocket boosters had exploded uh, and, and split off from the spacecraft, uh, sending it, of course, in a, in a crazy spiraling pattern for a few seconds. And then uh, debris started to fall out of the sky into the sea. Of course, they, they have search and rescue recovery people standing by for all these missions but it's almost become assumed that they would never go into action it it must be well, terrible for them too they've always been ready and certainly they they had uh, uh people parachuting into the uh, crash site uh, in the in the water within i would say two or three minutes after the event so uh, they were ready and uh, they they did perform as as they were supposed to but there seems little chance that they'll find anybody alive out there. For those who may have just tuned in, could you go over who the crew members are again? Yes, of course. Um, Frank uh, Scobie, the commander of this mission, Michael Smith, the pilot, Judy Resnick, a mission specialist, Ellison Onizuka, mission specialist, Ronald McNair, a black astronaut, also a mission specialist, Gregory Jarvis, who is a payload specialist, and... Uh, uh, Sharon Krista McAuliffe, the 37-year-old high school teacher from New Hampshire who was to have been America's first private citizen in space. And for those of us who have covered the space program for several years, some of those names are firsts in themselves. Ronald McNair, the first black astronaut in space. Judith Resnick was the second woman, I believe, in space. Or a third. She's among the first, certainly. Um, Dick Scobie, a veteran of space flights. Yes, he is. Well, mission uh, audio has been silent for a few minutes now, and uh, there has been no word specifically on what happened. Uh, all about all that uh, uh, the uh, mission uh, people have said is that uh, there was an explosion aboard the uh, aboard the shuttle Challenger, and of course the crew members at that point are very securely strapped into their seats. Uh, they have no uh, ejection seats or anything like that, any any kind of life-saving device like that, which you might expect to find in a fighter plane, and when something like that happens, it's uh, it's just the end. There is nothing they can do about it. They don't wear parachutes. There wouldn't be any way for them to get out of the spacecraft if they had the chance to do that anyway. They're sealed in there until they land. As we see in, in NASA's optics, uh, the Atlantic is just a stretch of blue calm um, belying what has just happened here. I see no debris. I see nothing as they scan the horizon there. No, I'm, I'm looking at that uh, at that video picture, too, and uh, I can't see anything like that either. You mentioned the solid rocket booster seemed to explode well, and burst away. Well, I, I was, I was, you know, tracking it with my eye, and um, it seemed that something popped out to the side. Another, another flaming rocket piece popped away to the side of the spacecraft, and the main body of it carried on for... Uh, uh, a little while longer and then started uh, gyrating and, and twisting in the sky and, and finally started plunging straight down. There were, of course, uh, there was, of course, a crowd of spectators in the stands. Hundreds of them. Hoping to celebrate Krista McAuliffe's triumph today. Yes, it was uh, pretty grim. I looked over that way uh, as soon as I could tear my eyes away from that terrible tragedy in, in the sky and... Uh, People were just, just, just leaving. I, you know, what, what else could they do? They were getting out of the grandstands and, and walking away. Uh, some of them seemed to be shaking their heads in disbelief, but uh, uh, there didn't seem to be any hysteria, no, no running. Uh, they just, 
like I, could not believe what their eyes had just recorded in their minds. A terrible thing for you and everyone there. And I think uh, it will take some time for the shock of this to sink in. Yes, indeed. Let's just um, recap here. Uh, we haven't gotten much additional information from uh, NASA recently, and uh, we'll just say that within uh, one minute of what appeared to be a perfect launch, there was an explosion this morning aboard the space shuttle Challenger carrying teacher Krista McAuliffe and six crew members to orbit. The rocket seemed to spin wildly in space for a few seconds and then plunged into the Atlantic. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News. CBS News, this is Doug Poling. What appears to be a terrible tragedy at the Kennedy Space Center. The shuttle Challenger with seven crew members exploded shortly after it was launched about 20 minutes ago. Challenger exploded and went down in flames less than two minutes into launch. It went out of control and appears to have fallen into the ocean. We have no word on the fate of the crew. CBS News correspondent Christopher Glenn is at the Space Center. Chris, what can you tell us now? Doug, I was um, watching the launch. Everything appeared to be going well. We were doing our broadcast and had just signed off. And about 10 seconds later, this was about 45 or 50 seconds into the flight, uh, there appeared to be a, a, an orange flame shoot out from one side of the shuttle Challenger. It seemed uh, almost to split in two. The main body of the rocket then uh, went into some uh, gyrations for a few seconds, and then debris started falling down into the sea, and we could see it happen. It was indeed a terrible sight. It was terrible for the mission controllers, too, and this was their first reaction. We have heard you know, looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. So that was the way Mission Control gave the news to the world um, that Shuttle Challenger had exploded. Apparently all the crew members, uh, none of them did survive. All right, we hear the ships and helicopters have raced to the area around the control center, and we also hear that paramedics have uh, leaped into the water, apparently to try to find any of the survivors. The crew members on this uh, uh, ship are Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, and crew members Judy Resnick, Ellison Ozanuka, Ron McNair and uh, Greg uh, Jarvis. Also, Kristen McAuliffe, a school teacher who was to become the nation's first civilian in space. At the White House, uh, Presidential uh, News Secretary, Assistant Secretary uh, Larry Speaks has uh, spoken just a few moments ago, and now we take you to what he had to say. The President is deeply concerned and, and shocked at uh, what he has just uh, seen replayed on television concerning the shuttle launch. Uh, we do not have any more information than is being provided to the public at this time. Uh, the way the Fed President found out about it is he was uh, in the Oval Office uh, with a group of senior staff uh, preparing for some questions with uh, a group of network correspondents and anchors that were having lunch in the White House uh, today uh, regarding the budget and the State of the Union. The Vice President and the Foreign Policy Advisor, John Poindexter, uh, came in with others and informed the President that the news had just broken. Uh, we immediately adjourned our Oval Office meeting and went into an adjoining uh, room, the President's study, where there's a television, and the President then began to review television reports of the uh, explosion there shortly after the launch. So once again, the President is, is concerned. He is, uh, is, is saddened. He is uh, very uh, anxious to have more information on it at the moment. As I say, we're learning most of our information from what the public is getting. As Larry speaks, the assistant uh, presidential news secretary, to recap and repeat what we know at this hour, the space shuttle Challenger exploded into a giant fireball just moments after liftoff about 25 minutes ago from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And apparently the crew members uh, might have been killed. At least that's the assumption at this point. There is no announcement, or no official announcement about the fate of the crew. It appears to be no way they, they could survive at this uh, time. Uh, Christopher Glenn is at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, Chris, uh, what uh, can you tell us now? 
Doug, uh, very little else. Uh, as you might expect, the uh, the uh, NASA people have been uh, very very reticent with the information while they try to put together the details of this tragedy. Uh, they did tell us, uh, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, that uh, uh, helicopters and rescue ships were on the way to the crash site, which appeared to be only a, a few miles offshore, uh, and that uh, paramedics had parachuted into the water. But also, as you mentioned, there there doesn't seem to be much chance that anybody survived this wreck. Uh, there are no uh, no emergency ejection systems or anything of the kind aboard the space shuttle. Uh, they have to fly uh, at least until uh, uh, the the main rocket uh, cuts off until they can they can do anything. Uh, but this just just happened in an instant, in a flash, without the NASA says without any indication that it was coming. The instrument readings were all normal at that point. And uh, it just exploded in the sky and came down. They never had a chance. It appears, of course, that the $1 billion spacecraft uh, Challenger was destroyed, and this is the first in-the-air disaster in 56 U.S. man and space missions, although three astronauts were killed in 1967 in a launch pad explosion during the Apollo program. The uh, crew members... Aboard Challenger today were uh, Francis Scobie, the commander, pilot Michael J. Smith, Judith Resnick, uh, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onazuka, and uh, Gregory Jarvis, and of course, uh, Krista McAuliffe, the 37-year-old schoolteacher from uh, New Hampshire who was uh, selected as America's first citizen in space. To repeat, the space shuttle Challenger has exploded shortly after liftoff from the at Kennedy Space Center, and apparently all seven astronauts aboard uh, were killed. We will have continued coverage of the space shuttle disaster over many of these CBS radio network stations. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. Now, direct from CBS News, this radio net alert bulletin. This is Judy Muller in New York. The space shuttle Challenger exploded after liftoff today, apparently killing all seven crew members, including the first civilian to be launched into space, Krista McAuliffe. There is no announcement of the fate of the crew, but it appears that there could be no way they would survive. The spacecraft appears to be destroyed, the debris being scattered into the Atlantic Ocean, there is no clue right now as to what might have caused the explosion. There was no indication of any problems on the computers, in mission control. No one had any indication that anything was wrong. It was the first in-the-air disaster in 56 U.S. man-in-space missions, although three astronauts were killed in the 1967 launch pad explosion. That was during the Apollo program. Again, the space shuttle Challenger exploded into a gigantic fireball moments after liftoff today with many, many people gathered at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida in the grandstands where they gathered to watch launches. Among those people were the school children, some school children, some of the family members. Christopher Glenn is at the Kennedy Space Center now. Chris, have we learned anything new? Well, uh, Judy, we do have with us now uh, NASA spokesman George Diller, and we're, perhaps we can get some additional information from him. George, can you add anything to the reports that we received from Mission Control? Uh, not, uh, not a great deal. Uh, one of the problems at this point is before we can send any emergency teams in to see what state uh, the orbiter is in, if it, it is in fact intact, uh, is that there is debris that falls from that altitude uh, that takes a considerable amount of time to impact the ocean. Uh, that is normally 15 minutes after any mishap. Um, the, uh, there is the possibility that we have gotten uh, some paramedics into that general area, but uh, most aircraft and ships will stay clear until the period of debris uh, has, uh, uh, has ended because the debris falling out of the sky obviously endangers the uh, the, the planes and, and the ships uh, that would be going in to do whatever rescue attempt that can be done. So we don't know what the uh, state of the orbiter is at this time, and uh, as soon as, uh, uh, by calculation, we know that the debris has uh, has cleared, then we can go in and, uh, and check the impact area, because we do know uh, from a flight dynamic standpoint where the vehicle has impacted. Can, can you tell us where that would be? How, how far offshore? 
Uh, it, it appears to be about 20 miles off the uh, off the Cape. Uh, this, this appeared to uh, have occurred as they were throttling back to go through the sound barrier through what we call Max Q, where you have the maximum stress on the vehicle. And uh, it, it appeared that we had an early solid rocket booster separation. Uh, we don't have any indication on on you know what the actual state of the solids were because we had good data on the solids and on the orbiter up until the time of the explosion. So everything is still very sketchy. Uh, I guess the big unknown at this point is whether or not the orbiter is intact. And uh, if it is, uh, we'll be having crews uh, go to the point where uh, it uh, has been tracked to impact. Now, this very painful question, uh, is it possible that anyone could have survived an accident like this? It, it depends on whether or not the orbiter is damaged. If the orbiter uh, did not explode and it is not seriously damaged, it will float for a period of time. Uh, if uh, if that, that's why we try to get crews in as, as soon as we can, because there is a period, uh, I believe, of about an hour where there's no problem. Now, uh, the to, to my eye, at any rate, it seemed as if uh, a part of the of the rocket assembly came off at first, and and the main portion of the rocket was still going forward for a few seconds. Uh, do your instrument readings give you any indication of exactly what what? part of the vehicle was involved in the explosion. Well, that, that's what I say when it appears that we had an early socket, solid rocket booster separation. But we don't know if it is one of, if, if one of the solids exploded or what has actually exploded because all the data at the time that occurred was good from both the solid rocket boosters and from the main engines of the orbiter. So we don't know what happened. Judy Muller in New York, I understand you have a question for George. Judy? Yes. I, uh, President Reagan has been following developments, Chris, at the White House, and we're going to go to Gary Schuster at the White House now for a reaction. Gary? The president's spokesman just came out and told us that the president was preparing to meet with some uh, network correspondents in preparation for his uh, State of the Union address tonight. He was going to answer some questions and talk with them at a luncheon here in the White House. When just before he was about to uh, go into that luncheon, uh, his national security advisor, uh, Admiral Poindexter, came in and told him what had happened. The president and some senior aides then went in a study, which is right next to the Oval Office, we're told, and watched the repetition of the uh, blast off and the explosion, apparently, that occurred in air. And the president, as speaks, described them. Just watched the television, the repeat of it. The, in almost stunned silence, uh, Mr. Speaks said you could almost see the sorrow and concern on the president's face. Uh, he said that basically that uh, they only know here what the news media is reporting. They've had no special reports from Florida, and uh, basically they, they are getting their information from the news media as it becomes available. Judy? Gary, I guess. The president is watching, as we all are, in, in shock and disbelief and waiting to find out if there's any possibility that that orbiter might have landed intact. And going back to Chris, that was a question, I, I suppose, that we will know um, soon, will we not? Well, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, if, as uh, NASA's George Diller has suggested to us a couple of moments ago, uh, there is the possibility that the orbiter, orbiter could have remained intact and plunged into the sea intact, uh, then it becomes a question of finding the orbiter. How deep is it? How quickly can we get divers down there to see what's going on? Now, don't forget at the same time that even if the orbiter were to have... Um, survived the explosion intact it was falling from an enormous height with uh, w I don't know exactly how high it was at the at the moment of the explosion but it was falling from a very very great height and uh, gaining uh, uh, speed as it came down and uh, when it impacted on the water it would be sort of like uh, driving into a brick wall uh, it's not just a, a swan dive it would be falling and and impacting with enormous force on it so even if it did survive intact, um, what could be the likelihood that uh, anyone could have survived the fall from that height? I don't know the answer to that. George Diller of NASA doesn't know the answer to that, and uh, NASA, of course, is bending uh, every possible energy to try to find the answer to that question. We can hope for the best, but it does not look good. How long do you think it will be before they know 
one way or the other. Well, he said it was 20 miles offshore or so, and they do have rescue teams on the site. Uh, I don't know how they are equipped or uh, whether they're equipped to do any deep-sea diving. Um, I was surprised to hear him say that it, it takes about 15 minutes for something to fall from the sky at that, that altitude. It appeared to my eye as I watched the debris falling toward the Atlantic that it was uh, approaching the surface of the water much uh, much more rapidly than that. But, uh, of course, I could be wrong. I, I did not see anything large enough to appear to be the, the main body of the shuttle. George Diller mentioned that this happened when they were throttling back and that, of course, is when there's a l more stress on the spacecraft. That's right. Uh, max Q, they call it. It's the time in the launch uh, and, and liftoff uh, and early stages of the flight sequence when they are subject to the most dynamic pressure, the most, uh, the most vibration, the most uh, G forces on them. And uh, what uh, George Diller said to us was that it appeared that one of the two solid rocket boosters had separated prematurely from the side of the vehicle. There is a point early, relatively early in the flight, within a, uh, the first few minutes, when those two solid rocket boosters are supposed, uh, as a matter of the natural sequence, to to uh, be blown away from the side of the uh, of the rocket assembly and fall into the sea to be recovered and brought back to uh, uh, Cape Canaveral for future use, use for, for reuse. But this one appeared as if one of those uh, solid rocket motors, which looked kind of like um, large Roman candles strapped to the side of the main fuel tank, had come off prematurely and gone its own separate way. Of course, uh, if that was the case, uh, the dynamic equilibrium of the whole uh, vehicle would be thrown into a tizzy, and uh, uh, the rest of the uh, of the vehicle, the main portion of the vehicle, could could not fly anymore. It would just spin out of control and go down. Now, we have in uh, the studio here with us now uh, uh, Jim Rivers, who is with uh, K WKXL in Concord, New Hampshire. They've been uh, sharing some of our office space here for the preparations for this flight. And, uh, Jim, can you give us uh, your impressions of what's happened and how the folks in Concord must feel? Well, as you can expect, uh, Chris, utter utter shock uh, and, and the tragedy of the situation. From down at this viewpoint, um, being my first time at, at seeing a shuttle launch and, and for many of the, the rookies down here and watching the launch you didn't know what to expect and so when you saw the ball of fire the first question was well is that what's supposed to happen and then veterans who are here you could see just the, the, the fear come over their faces that no that isn't what was supposed to happen back at Concord High School uh, party hats and noisemakers and New Year's Eve type of things had been handed out. The student body had lined into the, the auditorium and it had become just a, a festive affair. From the moment the countdown got down to the final minute, the cheering began and it began to build until liftoff. And even a, a minute in when the explosion came, the cheering and then all of a sudden silence. And as uh, we checked with Concord High School moments ago, uh, the auditorium is just littered with potty hats and noisemakers, and the students have, have filed out. The media has been asked to leave the high school. And, and you know, Chris, this is the second uh, tragedy, and it, uh, not quite as mammoth proportions, that has uh, befallen Concord High School this year. They, they had an incident there earlier in the year that the student body had to, had to come together in a, in a shooting incident, and it's just been a an extremely tough year on a student body at Concord High School, but the situation right now, as you would expect in the city of Concord, not only for Krista McAuliffe, but for the entire crew is, is just, pray to God that they're, they're out there somewhere. And the state of New Hampshire and the entire nation and uh, without a doubt the uh, entire world Chris? is uh, mourning this great tragedy. Yes, um, Judy. Among those uh, who are witnessing this today, President Reagan, and he was described as saddened by the events this morning. Just a few moments ago, White House spokesman Larry Speaks answered questions from reporters. The president's first priority is to find out what information uh, that is available. We just White don't. House spoken with the we case, just yeah. don't have any more. Uh, no, we have not. Not from the Oval Office. Will this affect uh, in any way the plans for the State of the Union tonight? I don't believe so. I'm certain that the president. Uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll feel compelled to to mention this, depending on the outcome of what we learn here in a few minutes. Will it affect the uh, shuttle program? Uh, well, that, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, here in 15 or 20 minutes after an incident of this type is concerned, I'm sure it will not affect uh, the United States' determination to consider uh, to continue the exploration of space and all the benefits we've received from it. While while this is, is indeed tragic, uh, 
uh, it certainly uh, uh, will not deter the United States in its interest in space exploration. Well, all the problems that the shuttle has had, will any substantial reevaluation be done of the program itself? Well, once again, you're, you're very premature in answer, asking a question concerning the future uh, of the space program. Uh, the United States has, has met adversity uh, many times before in the space program. It is one of the most effective and successful programs uh, uh, of that type that any country has ever undertaken. Larry, can you tell us anything specifically that the president said, any quotations, and did he make any mention of the fact that uh, the teacher that uh, he, he suggested, uh, that the program of a teacher in space, that that teacher was on board this flight? Well, I know that was on his mind. Quite frankly, the president was stood there in almost stunned silence as he watched the television. Uh, you could uh, you could certainly read uh, the concern, uh, the sorrow, uh, the anxiety uh, on his face as he watched, uh, and the group watched around him. As I say, he was he was virtually watched in silence. Might anyone from the White House uh, be leading some sort of investigating team, or will it just be up to NASA to investigate this? All this is. It's very, very early, and there's just nothing we can say. Our, our immediate concern is the is the crew, and uh, and all of these other questions will just have to be deferred. We were listening to Larry Speaks answering questions from reporters just moments ago at the White House about this tragedy and the explosion of the Challenger after liftoff today at Cape Canaveral. Gary Schuster's at the White House. Gary. Larry Speaks said that this accident won't deter future space exploration, but one can't help wonder how far it will be set back. Well, that's right, Judy, and I think Mr. Speaks perhaps was a little premature in saying that. Uh, of course, the administration has always uh, been in the, in the forefront of, of pushing space exploration, but uh, with, with this accident, uh, you just don't know where it's going to go, and I think, uh, I think before any definite idea is given as to where it, where it will lead, uh, it'll, it'll take a complete examination of this, uh, this accident. Thanks, Gary. In Gainesville, Florida, about 150 miles from the Cape, Gene Craven watched the liftoff from a rooftop. Watched, I get several liftoffs on the roof up there. And today, we figured that it was going to be an exceptional view because it was absolutely clear. And um, about 30 seconds or so after it cleared the horizon, uh, there was a bright flash, and we could see flame going off in three directions, and then nothing. And I knew that something was seriously wrong, having seen several liftoffs before, because on a clear day we would have been able to watch the, the flame of the booster for much longer. So we just saw the explosion and then flame going in three directions and then nothing but uh, the smoke from the exhaust. We've kind of taken it for granted. You were just kind of looking for the view. I mean, yeah, well, we've seen so many, um, so many launches that everything's gone pretty well that, uh, yeah, we were just up there for the view. But when I saw that explosion and uh, uh, pieces going off in several directions, well, we knew something was seriously wrong. Florida resident Gene Craven, one of many shock eyewitnesses of today's tragic launch. Among those, of course, watching was Christopher Glenn. Chris, anything new from the Cape at all? Now, Judy, it's uh, it's really t it's calm here. Of course, we're sitting uh, in the position from which we watch the space launches, and uh, it it's a benign-looking scene. About the only uh, reminder of this tragedy within our uh, eyes' range is uh, uh, the still the traces of those awful clouds that formed uh, as the rocket exploded, still drifting in the sky, no wind today uh, to push them out of the way. NASA has almost approximately, uh, seemed cursed in the last few uh, launches, this being, of course, the most tragic uh, possible uh, outcome uh, of um, a planned mission. But things have just been going so badly for them, and this is bound to set back the program, it, it would seem to me it'd be a long time before they send another civilian into space. I don't think they'll be sending anybody into space for quite a while, Judy. Uh, a tragedy of this type um, is, it will be a long time in the analysis stage as to why it happened, and um, it's not like if you fall off a horse, you get right back up on it and ride it again. This thing will be analyzed uh, to the nth degree, and it probably will be many, many months before we see another manned space flight again, I would imagine. Uh, 
Tuesday. We're getting some information from Mission Control now. Let's listen. At the time, uh, data stopped. Recovery forces being deployed to the field. Being, uh, they're unable, were unable uh, shortly to, uh, to enter the specific area because of the continuing falling debris. And at about this time, are being admitted to, to the impact area. Contingency procedures are in effect. And following those procedures, all of the data available in, in mission control uh, from the flight at the point uh, or up to the point of the incident, uh, data is being secured and will be carefully evaluated. We have no additional information at this time, and we'll keep you advised as other details become available. This is Mission Control, Houston. That report uh, not not adding very much uh, new to the cause of the explosion. Although, yes, Judy. Chris, it's amazing to me that the debris was still falling, that they had to stay out of that area this long. Well, as uh, NASA's George Diller told us a few minutes ago when he was here in the studio with us, um, it... it would take about 15 minutes for all of the debris to fall from that altitude and impact on the surface of the ocean. Uh, Diller also indicated the the only thing, the only indication we have of what exactly went wrong. Uh, he said that it appears that one of the solid rocket boosters uh, uh, separated from the main launch vehicle a little bit early, as a matter of fact, a lot early. And, of course, that uh, that would make the rest of the rocket, all motors firing at full thrust, uh, go awry. It would just fly around wildly until uh, it finally they were able to get it, get the motors cut off, and it just fell into the sea. The last tragedy uh, anywhere near this magnitude, of course, was the, um, the Apollo launch explosion. That was on the pad when which Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chafee were killed. Yes, that was not a space flight. It was a training mission. It was a static uh, Apollo module, and um, the situation at that point, I think it was in 1967, if I'm not mistaken, was that um, uh, there was a flash fire inside the command module, the Apollo command module, and before anybody knew what was happening or they could get them out, they were all asphyxiated and subsequently burned to death. It was, interestingly enough, January 27th. 1967. 19 years ago. Exactly. I, there, uh, there never has been, to my uh, recollection, any um, spaceflight tragedy of, these dimen of this dimension uh, in the history of manned spaceflight for any nation. Uh, of course, the United States has never had uh, anyone die in, in flight before. Only those, uh, those three, uh, Chafee, White, and Grissom, who died on the pad here at, at Cape Canaveral. Um, but the Soviets did have a couple of, of losses uh, of life. Uh, I seem to recall some time back, and I'm, I'm picking my memory for 15-year-old details here, but uh, two cosmonauts were killed on a landing attempt. Something went wrong there, and of course the Soviets are, are very hesitant about uh, explaining publicly any tragedies, and even at the time there was very little information on that, but I, I do recall that happened. And that's about the, uh, the worst previous in-flight manned spaceflight incident I, I can think of. Now, um, um, Judy, we do have George Diller back here with us uh, at this point uh, of NASA, and perhaps, George, you could give us some additional information. Well, what we've done at the Launch Control Center is to impound the data. Uh, the firing room uh, has been sealed. The personnel uh, in the firing room will not be allowed to leave and all, until all of the, uh, uh, the data has been uh, impounded so that it can be uh, studied uh, you know, when we go into a, a review of this. Uh, the uh, the incident occurred uh, about 18 miles downrange, but that is not where the debris is. Uh, we calculate uh, by uh, computer where, if there is a mishap, where the vehicle will impact the water should thrust terminate at some point. That appears to have happened somewhere uh, uh, up to about 60 miles offshore. Uh, the uh, the debris does appear to have cleared at this time, and they are sending in um, crews now to see whether or not the orbiter may by some chance be intact. And uh, we don't know what state the orbiter itself is in, so it's premature to speculate that we've lost it. We really don't know. Mm -hmm. at, uh, given a fall of a, of a body that massive from that great altitude, uh, is it possible it could have survived the impact in one piece? Uh, well, it, it depends on, uh, you know, what... The nature of the explosion was was it the solid rocket boosters or was it the orbiter uh if uh the explosion uh 
occurred uh, after we had separation, although it appears that it did not. Uh, and the orbiter was in any kind of, uh, you know, flyable shape. We have uh, ditching maneuvers, and the orbiter could float for up to an hour if, uh, if it's intact and not damaged. Now, if the orbiter's damaged, then how long it will float for is undetermined. Let me ask you a couple of technical questions. Um, after your instruments indicated that there had been a mishap, um, was there a cutoff of the other uh, motors or any switches thrown either by computer or by human hands to uh, turn off the rockets, so to speak? And secondly, um, is there any way... Uh, if the shuttle was still attached to the huge external tank that it clings to upon launch and which later drops away, uh, anyway, they could have gotten separated um, from, the ma from the main tank so they might have some uh, aerodynamic control coming down if they survived the explosion. Uh, when you go into a return to launch site uh, abort procedure, it, uh, it, it is part of that uh, computerized program to jettison the external tank. Uh, there is a program point in flight where the solids are separated and then the tank is separated uh, to give the orbiter the maximum amount of loft to come back to the runway. It does not appear that we had time to implement that program fully. So that's why they're uh, in a scenario where if the vehicle's intact, it, uh, it may have ditched. But we don't have any control of the shuttle uh, as far as onboard systems. That's all being handled onboard the spacecraft, and uh, there is nothing... Uh, you know, that we do to, uh, to control the vehicle after it's in flight. But uh, it, uh, it appears that uh, at, at the time that we lost contact with it, that everything was normal. We don't see any anomalies in the boosters or in the main engine data that indicated that anything was wrong. It just happened. So, you know, it's not knowing what happened. We don't know what shape the orbiter's in. One of the um, earliest words that we got from uh, mission control after the accident uh, was that all communication with the spacecraft had been lost. Um, was that uh, automatic, instantaneous? Did it just stop all of a sudden? That appears to be the case. Now, so is that all telemetry, telemetry or correct. just uh, all, voice communication? All voice and telemetry stopped at a, at a given point, uh, apparently at about a minute 12. Uh huh. And what altitude would the uh, rocket assembly have reached at that point? Uh, I, I'm not certain. I think they're at about 30 miles in altitude at that point. But uh, what they were, what they were doing was was uh, they, they had completed going through the sound barrier. They had throttled back. Uh, had completed that max Q transition, the, the maximum period of dynamic pressure, which is a load on, on the wing and on the vehicle, and then had begun to accelerate up to 108% and have apparently achieved that point. Uh, it is unclear whether or not the uh, increase in acceleration is in any way related to the explosion because we don't know yet what exploded. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier when you were uh, speaking with us um, about 25 minutes ago or so, um, you had said that you, you, you thought that perhaps one of the two solid rocket boosters had had an early separation. Um, if that were the case, how would that be possible? I mean, what... Well, normally what happens when you have a, uh, uh, a mishap is that one of the, the first things that occurs is to so separate the solid rocket boosters. Uh, early on, it was not real clear whether or not the boosters had separated before or after the explosion occurred. Uh, and I, I, I still don't think that's clear. It, it appears, in, in looking, you know, at the tape that we've seen, that everything happened all at one time. That it essentially was a self-destruct kind of thing. And that if the brief boost, if the booster separated, uh, they uh, they separated only after uh, a computer program had become aware that there was a problem and instructed the boot the boosters to separate. Mm -hmm. Now you say that uh, all of the data um, from the flight has been impounded for analysis. Uh, when might, might we get some uh, preliminary word on uh, on the results of that analysis, do you think? That's uh, liable to be a long time in coming. It's We're talking about days or weeks or... Oh, it'll be months. Months. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not something... We may have a quick look uh, that where we can advance some theories, but uh, it will be several months before uh, there are any conclusions. And as far as the, um, the very ambitious schedule that NASA had laid out for the shuttle uh, flights this year, what happens now? Is everything automatically canceled? or? Uh, well, I think that's an announcement that would have to be made by the NASA administrator. But uh, it's very unlikely that we would be doing any flying before we understand what's happened. All right, NASA's George Diller, a spokesman for NASA, and, um, of course, uh, uh, upset as I am and everybody who uh, saw this.
truth. An ungodly thing happened in the sky in front of our eyes is at the moment. And thank you for being with us once again, George, and shedding some light on this uh, enormous and awful tragedy. This is Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. If I may just br briefly recap uh, about one minute into this morning's flight of Shuttle Challenger carrying uh, school teacher Krista McAuliffe, the first American citizen in space, uh, first American private citizen in space, and her six uh, crewmates. Uh, there appeared to be an explosion in the air about uh, 18 miles down range, and um, the rocket went haywire, spun around in the sky a few times, and then fell toward the sea. Uh, it is uh, NASA's uh, hope that to somehow, some way, the orbiter survived the explosion, the orbiter itself survived the explosion intact, and might have been able to perform a successful ditch in the Atlantic. Uh, rescue teams are moving to the uh, crash site now, and uh, what they will find there is uh, uh, is anyone's guess at this point. But uh, from the eyeball view of it and from all indications so far, the lack of communication, anything else, it did, did not appear that anyone survived uh, the explosion this morning. I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is Judy Muller in New York as Chris has been trying to glean clues into why... This has happened, the technical aspects. We've been hearing more and more about the human tragedy of this. The students at Krista McCullough's Concord High School in New Hampshire were cheering the launch when a teacher yelled for them to be silent because something appeared to be wrong. And as it became clear that there was an explosion, the students murmured, this can't be real, we can't be watching this. Students were ordered back to their rooms. Many of them protested that they wanted to continue watching. McCullough's husband and her two children age six and nine were thought to be watching the launch from a special viewing area at Cape Canaveral. A few minutes ago, we spoke with Concord, New Hampshire Junior High School Principal Chris Rapp. She is a friend of Chris McAuliffe and watched the liftoff this morning with students at the school. Most of our youngsters were either in class or in a, a cafeteria where the entire eighth grade eats together. And we had the television on and we delayed the bell so that they could watch the, the launch and as we all watched it, the kids cheered wildly and jumped up. And then there was kind of a period of time where we started to dismiss them to go to the next period class. Uh, yet those closest to the TV kept watching, and a youngster said to me, This is Rath, it just blew up. And I said, No, no, I wasn't watching. I said, It must be the, the rockets coming off. They make, they sometimes look like something exploded. And then I looked over, and one of the teachers turned around just shook his head, and he said, No, it blew up. And at that point, there was just kind of a stunned feeling our youngsters continued being well trained continued to go to their next period class at that time we made an announcement throughout the building and right now the ninth grade is in the cafeteria eating watching most of the youngsters are in the classroom with a teacher um either listening to it on a radio or watching television that's quite a, kind of a, a quiet period um we have a number of upset youngsters we have some counselors in the building who are starting to form groups of youngsters who just need to talk about it and we'll probably need to do that with some staff, all many of whom know Krista. She taught here a, l a number of years ago and only for a short time, but she clearly has been a town celebrity, and people have a lot vested in this space shuttle, and I think feel a tremendous mixture of feelings. I know I do at this point. I talked to Krista last summer when she was applying, and we kind of joked about it, and, and I said, you know, I, I don't even like going up in an elevator. Krista, how can you be doing this? And she was, all, as she is, she was very bubbly and... and said, oh, I, you know, I've got to fill out this application, something I just have to do. And I've seen her periodically over the fall, very short periods of time. And um, she, as she always comes across, that is the way Krista is. She was always very enthusiastic. And even we sat together and watched a youth hockey game not long ago, and she was tired. And she really, at that point, wanted to know all the town news and wasn't talking so much about her net news as much as our town news. And, so there is a, a tremendous mixture of feelings as you soar to the heights with this success and, and wonderful accomplishment of somebody you know and then have to watch it all come to pieces in front of your eyes. That's Chris Rath, the principal of Roundlet Junior High School in Concord, and she's a friend of Krista McCullough. Uh, she says, as we heard, that she had even kidded Krista about the danger. Of course, in addition to Krista McAuliffe, uh, the, t the first teacher in space, the crew included Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, Ron McNair, Greg Jarvis, Ellison Onizuka, and Judy Resnick. Several of those people, veterans of space travel, 
But of course, at the time when Challenger exploded, all the expertise and all the training and all the skill in the world couldn't have helped them. This was out of their hands. Chris Fraser, a CBS radio affiliate WKXL, was at Concord High School in New Hampshire this morning to cover the shuttle liftoff. To say uh, everything is extremely upset right here. Um, they have asked the students to leave the auditorium. Um, there are uh, spent uh, noisemakers uh, littering the floor right now. Um, the children walked out of the auditorium in more or less a state of shock, needless to say. Uh, no one knew what happened right when it went up. Uh, as Jim said, when the second uh, explosion more or less happened, everyone thought it was just part of the, maybe a booster or something. No one knew. Everyone was cheering as the launch went up. Um, the students were asked to leave as soon as the explosion was announced. The students were asked to go back to the class and the media uh, has been asked to clear out. Um, as I said, uh, there are streamers and confetti littering the floor here right now. Everyone is uh, extremely upset. When, as soon as there was, there was noise continuing throughout the launch, everyone was screaming. As soon as they heard uh, that something went wrong, the room became uh, absolutely silent. There, there was not a word spoken by anyone. The students filed out in absolute silence. And many of them uh, just with, with shocked, stunned looks at their face. I had asked um, yesterday and say many of the students uh, if they thought, if they were at all nervous, uh, aside from being just excited that Chris McCall was, was going into space, and, and I didn't have one student tell me that they were worried or concerned. Uh, I guess these things have just become so routine that the thought of, of danger uh, never even enters anyone's mind. Chris Fraser, a teacher's triumph turned tragedy in a matter of minutes. Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center is talking has been talking with somebody from Krista McAuliffe's hometown. Chris? Yes, it's uh, Jim Rivers of WKXL, also um, the uh, Concord uh, New Hampshire station. Uh, he's been down here to uh, to take a look at the launch and uh, has been sharing some of our studio space with us. Jim, uh, uh, any, any further insight into the uh, way uh, Concord feels about this? Well, again, uh, Chris, as we mentioned earlier, the, I've been in contact with the city, um, and it's it's desolate. Everyone, uh, we talked to a caller on a talk show this morning, and he said you thought that the town had been evacuated. Everybody was in front of TVs, and so this is an event that, that people aren't just going to read about in the papers. It's something that everybody saw as it happened, and a lot of us in Concord our rookies, as I said earlier, in, in seeing this, and, and as Chris Fraser has indicated, when we saw the, the ball of fire, we all thought it was part of, of the whole event. And everybody is just sitting back and praying and, and hoping that there are seven people out there in the water somewhere. We've had a couple of calls uh, to the studio here in the building uh, in the last few minutes from concerned people. Uh, we had a call from a, a young boy who wanted to talk to someone and, and asked if the apple had anything to do with it. It, it just thoughts that are going through people's mind. It, a, uh, a, a member of the closeout team uh, outside the rocket just before Krista McAuliffe got aboard this morning handed her an apple for the uh, teacher. Yeah. Yes. And then this, young, this young listener said, oh, did anyone check the apple? So everybody's saying why? What happened? What went wrong at this point? Well, as we heard from NASA's George Diller, it may be um, months literally before we get any firm answers to that. Uh, he did have an indication, uh, at least he, he, he said it appeared that uh, one of the solid rocket boosters on the rocket assembly had a premature separation and thereby unstabilized the dynamic configuration of the rest of the flight. Um, Jim, what do you suppose will happen in Concord as a result of this, uh, looking beyond the immediate uh, astonishment and, and the stunned uh, nature of the people up there? What, what what will happen in the weeks ahead in Concord, do you think? Uh, the, the city of Concord is a, a strong community. They've, they've been through things like this uh, in the past, and, and they'll survive and go on and go on living. But it's going I think it's going to be a long period of, of mourning uh, for Krista McAuliffe and her crewmates. And, and I'm not sure if we will ever totally uh, recover from this. Uh, because, as I say, everybody in the community, bar probably none at the point of liftoff, were watching were listening, and everybody found out together. Yes. Uh, yesterday, of course, uh, New Hampshire's young governor, John Sununu, was, was down here hoping to watch the launch, and then they had uh, a weather delay yesterday, and he had to go uh, go back to Concord um, last night. Uh, 
Is there any word from him yet about this? He has not made a statement yet. We uh, expect uh, to hear from him uh, soon. I know that uh, we, uh, our news department have been in touch with his office, and he uh, will be coming out with a, a statement. A lot of the people in Concord, the school superintendent, uh, uh, Mark Bove, the school uh, board president, Mike Dunn, were down here. They have gone home. I talked with Susan Anderson, uh, a teen teacher uh, out in Idaho, at, with Barbara Morgan. Uh, Idaho people were down here. They've all gone home to watch it on TV. Well, it was about uh, an hour and two minutes ago that Shuttle Challenger, less than uh, a minute and a half off the launch pad, exploded in flight. The uh, fate of the crew still officially unknown, how explosion. Uh, it was an awful long way down, and um, uh, the water there is quite deep. They're about 20 miles offshore, so it's going to be a long time before we get any information on uh, what has happened to the crew, but it does not appear uh, too bright for their survival at this point. Judy Muller in New York. Yes, Chris. Uh, CBS News correspondent Ike Pappas in Washington is in the office right now of the congressman who was on the previous shuttle flight, Congressman Nelson. Ike? Hey, I'm listening. What is Congressman Nelson's reaction to this? Well, Congressman Nelson, Bill Nelson, the Florida Democrat who only nine days ago returned uh, to Earth aboard the uh, challenge, the uh, Columbia sat uh, in his office watching the liftoff of the next shuttle, Challenger, on a closed-circuit NASA monitor. Congressman Nelson has not emerged from the office as yet, but his press secretary is telling us that when the explosion occurred, there was nothing but silence in the room. Congressman Nelson is the uh, chairman of the uh, Space Science and Technology uh, Subcommittee. He is meeting with the staff of that subcommittee at the moment. Uh, his press secretary says that uh, no one said a word in the room. Uh, comments will have to wait, according to Congressman Nelson. The Congressman Nelson is quoted as saying, I need time to get everything together. So he has scheduled a 3 o'clock news conference today when he can possibly shed a little bit more light on what occurred uh, aboard that uh, shuttle. Uh, Congressman Nelson, you know, understands the frustrations that uh, must have uh, been felt by the crew members of the Challenger, including uh, the Mrs. McAuliffe, because uh, it took, I believe, if my uh, memory serves me, um, I guess seven scrubs they went through on Columbia, and uh, and then it took them, I guess, three or four times before they could safely come down aboard Columbia. So he understands what the frustrations were and probably what the perils were in this kind of a mission. So for the moment, I think we have to wait to see what Congressman Nelson discovers and what his reactions to this event are. Like, despite the tragedy that the president reportedly plans to go ahead with his uh, State of the Union message tonight, um, and Larry Speaks said, I'm certain the president will feel compelled to mention this, and depending on the outcome. I imagine Senator Jake Garn will be following events today with some interest, too, as he was the first politician to go into space. Absolutely. I uh, believe that Senator Garn, as a matter of fact, has scheduled a news conference for uh, 15 minutes from now and uh, will be uh, giving his reactions and uh, telling us uh, perhaps what he knows about uh, and what he has learned from NASA because these astronauts are tied, uh, I guess, uh, in perpetuity to uh, the NASA Control Center for every launch because they, uh, they can contribute and they can learn uh, from these launches themselves even if they have been in space. And I'm sure that Senator Garn uh, is feeling what Senator Nelson is feeling. I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Nelson is feeling, and uh, uh, people who are feeling all over uh, the world who have been close to this uh, space program, and those of us who have covered uh, the space uh, program over the years are feeling a great sense of tragedy and loss at this moment, and there's no question, although Bill Nelson has not articulated that yet, there's no question from the tone, from the mood, from the sense, from the atmosphere in his office that there is a, a, a great aura of, uh, of grief and, uh, and uh, dismay at this event. And certainly the president is going to, uh, it, it, it should be assumed that he will, he will certainly mention this in some form this evening. Mike Pappas on Capitol Hill. CBS News Pentagon correspondent uh, Chris Kelly is also standing by. Chris, what have you learned there at the Pentagon? 
Well, so far, the main recovery effort seems to be underway by the Coast Guard. They have a couple of ships in the area there, along with aircraft availability uh, to see what they can uh, achieve there. Uh, at the same time, the Navy says two ships that happened to be in the general vicinity. They weren't there on station, they weren't there on duty, but they were in the general location, are now rushing toward the disaster area. One, we're told, is about 45 minutes away, a hydrofoil which carries about 21 men. Another ship, a U.S. Uh, guided missile frigate with 200 men, is steaming toward the location, but uh, that ship is uh, a good two hours away. So uh, they will, the Navy will go there assist the Coast Guard in whatever recovery and search efforts uh, they can uh, they can achieve. Uh, in addition to that, uh, a Navy official said that, as best they could tell, there were no Soviet ships in the immediate area. Uh, we don't know if the Soviets this time were off the Florida coast, well off the Florida coast, I should say, watching this launch. They have been out there in the past. Whether they were there this time is unknown, but at least we know in this case that there are uh, no Soviet ships in the immediate area of the disaster, and uh, as best the Navy can tell, there were no ships uh, anywhere around because, of course, that area had been cleared prior to the launch. Judy? Thanks, Chris. I'd like to ask you to stand by for just a moment. We need to go down to the Cape now. Uh, Christopher Glenn has been trying to follow developments. Chris? Uh, yes, Judy. We just uh, had another uh, report from uh, Mission Control while you were talking with Chris Kelly. And uh, we're, it just it has concluded, and we're going to turn that tape around for you and play that back in just a moment here. Uh, Jim Rivers of Station WKXL in Concord, who's been speaking with us, uh, has been down here for the launch and uh, has been speaking with us about the reaction in Concord, has told me uh, a moment ago that the students at Concord High School who had been gathered in the auditorium to watch a large screen TV uh, version of the, of the uh, launch and had been cheering and saw this thing happen in front of their eyes uh, have now been dismissed for the day uh, as of one o'clock and they will go home to be with their families now we have this tape uh, just within the last two minutes or so for mission control let's hear that this is mission control houston at 11:48 a.m central standard time recovery teams are uh, searching the impact area off the coast of uh, launch pad uh, launch pad uh, 39b where uh, earlier this morning on ascent we had uh, an incident uh, approximately one minute after uh, ascent uh, an apparent explosion as the uh, space shuttle had uh, shortly uh, before i uh, reached uh, a throttle back uh, position the uh, range safety teams uh, were unable to get uh, the uh, rather the uh, uh, rescue teams, the search and rescue teams, uh, delayed in getting into the area because of debris continuing to fall uh, from uh, very high altitudes uh, for as long, uh, almost as an hour uh, after uh, after ascent. Those teams uh, in place now uh, in the search area. additional information as it becomes available to us. This is Mission Control Houston. So again, a, uh, a rather skimpy report from uh, Mission Control on what they know right at the moment. Uh, we're looking at pictures provided by NASA cameras aboard uh, a helicopter or apparently in the search area uh, about 20 miles offshore and uh, they do show some yellowish streaks in the water but no uh, visible wreckage or debris of any kind. Uh, presume that some of those uh, those yellow streaks are chemical residue from uh, from the main fuel tank or from the orbiter's uh, fuel tanks itself. Uh, one very poignant shot that they had was looking back over the water uh, toward the land and uh, in the very distant horizon you can see the very noticeable uh, beacon and profile of the um, vehicle assembly building where they put these things together in a vertical configuration and then roll them out to the launch pad. Uh, but uh, as of now, we know very little else about the fate of the crew members except it's uh, probable that uh, none of them survived this, uh, this tragedy today. And we do have um, some word from uh, NASA spokesman Jim Mizell, which has been gathered on tape, and we'd like to uh, play that tape for you now. 
Uh, everything looked perfectly normal, and uh, it looked like it about one minute into the flight. And at that point, uh, it appeared to uh, have a disintegration of a part of the shuttle system. At that time, we could not tell whether it was a solid rocket booster or the main orbiter or anything else. Uh, my first impression was that we were getting ready to have a perform a, a return to landing site because uh, something occurring at that point is normally what would have occurred. Um, in a few moments, it became obvious that, uh, that we could see nothing coming out of the uh, explosion that was headed back toward Kennedy Space Center. So uh, it became obvious that uh, the pieces were going to fall in the ocean. And from that point on, uh, that's about all the data that we had. We did hear that uh, there was some impact of some uh, of the orbiter somewhere 20 miles down range. And, and the Air Force has dispatched helicopters to the site. And uh, we have no report as to what they have found. Or we have had no report on uh, the cause of the apparent explosion. Uh, Jim, was there any indication at all that the shuttle was in distress at any point? Uh, from what we have heard from uh, Mission Control and uh, from the engineering people at this time, uh, there was no indication as to what occurred. Um, there was uh, a statement that it was an explosion, and uh, really that uh, the statement was not very clear as to exactly where did the explosion take place and why. So I think they're going to be evaluating data for quite some time before they release any information, and uh, certainly they're going to have to uh, hear from those people uh, in the rescue area before there any, can be any speculation as to uh, the status of the crew or the orbiter. Jim, tell us about that what is rescue operation. Tell us where the paramedics were flown in from and tell us about the operation. Well, as you're well aware, we launch into a section of the ocean that is controlled by uh, uh, central control for the Air Force. It's the Eastern Test Range, and this is all controlled by Patrick Air Force Base, and they have a range safety control at Cape Canaveral. Uh, we had a helicopter force so on standby that uh, normally patrols this area doing missions or doing shuttle launches, and those same helicopters were available and were in patrol at that time. And uh, this is not something we do for this mission, but we do it for every mission. So the Air Force really handles all of our search and rescue as far as any contingency or emergency operations are concerned. And uh, that plan was put into effect immediately as soon as it became apparent that something was wrong. And um, at the present time, uh, we have not heard from them on any anything decisive as to uh, what they found or what they're, what they're seeing at that point out there. Have there been any indications at all from the rescue team? There has not been any indication at this time, to my knowledge. Uh, of course, uh, I suspect they are setting up a, a team to evaluate uh, what's going on, and they're probably much in closer touch with the uh, rescue team than we are here. In order to get close to Jim Mizell, thank you. And that tape um, uh, provided by uh, Frank Motek of our uh, Miami affiliate WINZ. And Frank, you're in the uh, studio with me now. Um, did you find out anything over uh, else over there at the press center? At the moment, uh, they're still trying to learn as much as they can from the rescue team that has been dispatched to the area. Uh, the faces still uh, tell the story of uh, shock and disbelief. At this point, everyone is waiting to get more information from that team that's been sent out there. A couple of other things I think we ought to mention at this point. Um, this launch of Challenger this morning was um, uh, from a new shuttle launch pad a couple of miles due north of the one that they've used for all of the previous shuttle launches. Uh, everything there had checked out perfectly, and of course, since the explosion occurred uh, a minute and 15 or 12 seconds into the flight, uh, there, that didn't really seem to have anything to do with it. Uh, the, the new um, launch pad was supposed to give NASA a much greater uh, flexibility for this year's crowded launch schedule, but of course at this point it doesn't appear that they will have a crowded launch schedule uh, at any rate. There also had been a number of days of delays of this launch uh, as NASA exercising its uh, customary caution uh, would not fly when it was raining, they would not fly when the crosswinds on the ground were blowing too hard, that was yesterday. There was a brief hold up for an hour this morning before launch while they waited for ice to clear off of the shuttle vehicle and of course none of those factors seemed to enter in it, into it either. Judy Muller in New York. To recap once again, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded about two minutes after liftoff from Cape Canaveral and plunged into the Atlantic some 60 miles away. The fate of the seven-member crew, including teacher Krista McAuliffe, is unknown, but it's unlikely that any of the astronauts have survived. We do not know that for sure. It appeared the rocket booster may have separated prematurely and exploded, but that is not known for sure. In fact, nothing is known for sure. In the words of NASA spokesman George Diller, it just happened. 
In addition to McAuliffe, a teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, the crew includes Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, Ron McNair, Grave Jarvis, Ellison Onizuka, and Judy Resnick. The Senate has scheduled a prayer session for this afternoon. The White House, as President Reagan watched in silence, a replay of the accident. Uh, the president was described as saddened and anxious to have more information as the nation is saddened in shock and we fear a nation in mourning. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Judy Muller, CBS News.